Well, so welcome, welcome to UBC today, and I must say you are a um, endeavoring bunch to have a conference on the day before the long weekend. Uh, but great to see so many people here, and it was noticeably quieter as I came to campus this morning. Um, you all know this, but you know one of the great things that, that I find about my role is I get to learn about a lot of areas on campus. That the Sea Around Us initiative was named after Rachel Carson's book, The Sea Around Us, and was founded in 1999 as a unit at the Fisheries Center, now the Institute for Oceans and Fisheries at UBC. Here. Since its inception, the Sea Around Us mandate has really been to assess global fisheries. And the amount of work that has been done here at UBC and that has been led globally is truly amazing. The assessments that have been done by looking at data about fisheries has really led to an extensive body of research that's highly cited. We know it's one of the strongest areas of research here at UBC. And not only is it strong here uh, in the Pacific Northwest, but it's really been shared with partners and influencers to change how the world thinks about fisheries and marine ecosystems. Collaborations that have been built and the knowledge exchange that have, ha have happened are really not only um, key ways that UBC really impacts the world, but are also uh, models for the kinds of innovation that we're trying to encourage here at UBC. More than 400 scientists have worked in 273 countries to contribute to the database of marine fisheries catches that grew from the sea around us. Covering all the countries and territories from the Arctic to the Antarctica, the database is regularly updated and goes beyond many of the official statistics to give a more comprehensive perspective of the sources of catches around the world. And maybe most amazingly is the fact that this database has shown that the world estimations of catch are actually about 50% higher than what's officially reported. And if you think about the, the role that that data is gonna play and how we actually react to that, how we actually think about our, our oceans, it's truly significant. The data has also shown that the global catches have been declining at a significant rate since the mid-90s and has exposed wasteful industrial practices of fish being thrown back into the ocean or diverted away from human consumption. This work has been possible due to generous cont contributors from funders such as the Pew Charitable Trust, which kicked off the project back in 1999 with a $2.1 million grant. Ongoing support has been uh, generously provided by the Oak Foundation, WWF, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Paul G. Ellen Family Foundation, MAVA, Marisla, the Paul M. Angel Family Foundation, the Packard Foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies Oceana, and the Mindaroo Foundation, amongst many others. So truly, on behalf of myself, on behalf of President Santa Ono, I'd like to congratulate everybody here that's been involved in this work over the past 20 years. I am sure for many of you, it might daily feel like it really was 20 years, but overall, 20 years goes by really so quickly, and the amount of impact that this group has had is truly amazing. So I congratulate you, and I hope that you have an absolutely amazing day, and that the sun comes out, and at the end of the day, you can really enjoy that as well. Take care. Yeah, so uh, uh, good morning, and uh, I certainly want to add my um, uh, congratulations to uh, those that uh, Gail just offered you on this auspicious day. Uh, so it's a huge pleasure to be here with you to, to uh, help uh, welcome our uh, distinguished uh, guests. And uh, I've uh, you know, looked through the agenda for today and uh, it looks exciting and broad and completely topical and I wish I could stay, uh, but, uh, but uh, I cannot today. Uh, so um, congratulations to you all uh, for the work that you've done over the last 20 years uh, to the Sea uh, Around Us team and especially to Dan and Polly uh, for having built this remarkable and long-lived uh, collaboration. This is really a tremendous accomplishment and I have some appreciation for how much work went into getting it started and the even larger efforts uh, uh, that are involved in uh, keeping the team together uh, and making forward progress. So congratulations to you on uh, this accomplishment. I would say uh, that this is uh, one of the signature programs that we have uh, that have established uh, UBC in its leadership position in the area of biodiversity and uh, sustainability. Uh, and I'm uh, particularly appreciative of the uh, scientific advances that were needed in order to do this, in particular the pioneering use of modeling and large-scale uh, but complex data collections uh, that are used to draw inferences uh, that uh, subsequently can have uh, substantial uh, social uh, impact. And I think increasingly this is uh, the level uh, to which we hold uh, ourselves uh, as uh, scientists. 
Uh, so the uh, ability to have such impact uh, seems to me uh, to be related to uh, the clarity and immediacy uh, of how uh, the data are presented. Uh, one only needs to look at your website to see uh, that you have the remarkable uh, uh, philosophy uh, that by making uh, both uh, the, uh, the data and the models uh, available uh, to scientists, to decision makers, or uh, to citizens, uh, allows them to access those data and answer some of their uh, own questions. Uh, and, uh, and so I think that this is, um, uh, again, something uh, remarkable uh, that you've developed. Uh, in particular, you've been extremely effective in your advocacy for the fisheries, uh, both with governmental and NGO groups around the world, uh, and uh, that has, of course, uh, really helped. Uh, and your ability to sort of model the outcome of decisions, I think, uh, you know, uh, lends a particular uh, 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 strength to our, our, our conf or confidence to our ability to guide decisions that would be about resource ste stewardship or, or use. So this group uh, has uh, played, the word again, a significant uh, role in providing uh, the information that we need about global changes in, in uh, biodiversity uh, in a setting that is uh, otherwise uh, quite um, uh, inaccessible other than through uh, the fisheries where we can make a connection in particular to human needs uh, in a very uh, graphical way. Uh, so you've taken a holistic approach, I think, uh, which is again uh, exemplary, uh, where uh, you have a rigorous base in science, uh, but uh, by including that advances in modeling methodology, uh, you can consider different sorts of driving forces that could affect the populations and then provide uh, perhaps views of alternative futures uh, that could be available to us, uh, resulting from different decisions that could be taken. So when I first heard about this work last fall, uh, during my listening tour in uh, the Institute of Fisheries, some of you might remember that, um, I, have to, uh, I have to say that I was thrilled by the audacity uh, of the idea of making a meaningful model that could describe global phenomena. But I have to be honest with you, I was also quite skeptical. Uh, over the course of the last year, though, uh, many of you have helped me uh, to understand better uh, the, uh, the basis of the work uh, and uh, the way in which you approach it uh, and uh, the soundness of uh, the conclusions. Uh, and so, and uh, in particular, uh, you've really impressed me by your ambition uh, of how much uh, work uh, you feel is left uh, to do. Uh, and so uh, with that, I'd like to... Um, I uh, wish you every success uh, in the next uh, 20 years and uh, to congratulate you on everything that you've done in the last 20 years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome, uh, guests, uh, friends, and uh, see around us family. Um, uh, my talk will be a little bit more personal, and I'll tell you the story how I got involved into this. Um, more than about 20 years ago, uh, two already prominent scientists, Daniel Pauli, a fisheries scientist, Daniel Pauli and Willy Christensen, decided to take part um, on a gigantic job to answer a seemingly simple question. How much fish do we really harvest from the world ocean? Don't make mistake, governments do collect statistics and um, catch data and submit them to FAO where it's held. However, there is an official statistics and there is a true catch. <laughs> For either political reasons, either political reasons or logistical difficulties, the official fishing statistics is often not really the true one. Uh, it can be a, a law, as major components of the fish catch is hard to account for. Fishers, for example, do not really count the fish which they and their families eat or they sell or trade in the local market. On the other hand, it can be elevated because the big boss dictates to get uh, to dictates it the right number to get a promotion however what was very interesting that who else but these prominent scientists actually decided to step up and acknowledge the problem that overfishing is happening because they believe that overfishing is acknowledging this properly it would be the role to recover of the fishers so they understood right from the beginning that uh, it won't be possible to do them by themselves. So over the years, they carefully crafted and trained an army of scientists, something around 400 people or 400 researchers, the size of the small battalion, by the way, <laughs> which consisted of about one third or more than one third of females, by the way, as well. And it's really 
accounted for about 200, people came from all over the place, from 273 countries to be precise, to conduct these uh, uh, catch reconstructions. So, supported by the uh, uh, by a few charitable trusts, Daniel and Billy launched 19, in 1999, around us. As Gail already said, it came from the book of the um, the second book of 1951, Rachel Carson. I know this uh, this author who is incredibly scientifically uh, inspiring. She is not just scientifically correct in her books, but she is also inspiring people. I knew her another book, which is Sunny Spring, which is single-handedly essentially ended DDT production in the United States and launched the environmental movement in the United States to control the pesticides. It obviously took some time to figure out uh, the right methodology uh, because launching comprehensive analysis it had to be very similar. It had to be had a consistent approach. It had to be done by country. And the ingenuity of this was that they would they would pick the person who speaks the local language, who is familiar with the setting, and that person would be in charge of the, really doing this reconstruction for the whole country. But the first task they took, they really zoomed in into the small scale fisheries. And small scale fisheries is something which is really poorly presented in, a, in official statistics. And the cage reconstructions relied on a range of information, including government data, scientific literature, expert opinions, and so on and so forth, to reconstruct current and historic catches. After this, they, um, they legally and unregulated fisheries, and uh, by catch estimates followed all these reconstructions. And to cut the long story short, which you will probably hear a little bit more today, I'd like to say that they concluded that um, 50, I mean, whatever we're catching right now is about 50%, as Gail mentioned, higher than nearly the catching capacity or killing capacity of the world ocean, um, which already been established um, in, the, in the official statistics. We were right at the killing capacity, but we in fact catching at least 50% more. And while the official statistics said that it's stable, the new data indicate that it's actually declining. So we might actually overshoot already the catching capacity. <clears throat> um, so this initiative was not only for thinking in, in its focus, but also progressive in practice. It was open access because they both believe, the organizers and uh, who was actually running this, both believe that open access information and transparent and widely accessible is the way to go uh, uh, to, to challenge overfishing. Through all of this, Daniel was main PI of this project, and but he, was, he had help from many fantastic project managers like Nigel Hagen, Jackie Alder, Longest Dirk Zeller, and now Dan Palomares. But also the hundreds of students, grad students, postdocs, researchers from all over the world, not just from IOF or from uh, Canada, it's all over the world. And there is now my little story how I came about this, joining this little battalion. Um, it started, in fact, in South Africa. And uh, <coughs> I, before, in, before Canada, I've been in South Africa for 10 years. And about halfway through, some uh, librarian from uh, um, the Sea Fisheries Institute, which is equivalent to GF4 here in Canada, contacted me and said, well, we have a book, Russian in Russian, uh, which is nobody claimed for 40 years. Do you want this? Because we're just going to burn it. <laughs> and I said, okay, fine, I mean, it's, it's a book. Well, send it to me. So they sent it to me, and I was really surprised when it arrived. And it was a rare first edition of the 1949, um, uh, uh, the commercial fishes of the USSR, led by the Lev Semyonovich, a very prominent mm -hmm. Russian uh, etiologist. So I opened this, it's beautiful pictures and everything. It's nice, like, if not the scientific value, it was probably but bibliographic, uh, bibliography kind of rarity. So I put it in, in the shell and forgot about this for 10 years. About 2010, when I arrived in Canada already, Dirk and Daniel caught me in, in the passage that you gave me very constructing Arctic fisheries. And we need something from Russia because we have something from Canada, from America, but almost nothing in Russia. And I think it was in the FAO documentation, it was about eight, eight, 800 tons only caught, but as in the combi. 
they were particularly interested in one family, Carigonidae, uh, genus Carigonus, which, which I knew was harvested there. So, out of curiosity, I opened this book, and the old Russian Soviet Union books, when they describe the species, they would actually show four, five, or maybe sometimes six or seven years of the catches of this fish. So I just compiled them, and kind of three days later, I brought to Daniel and Dirk and said, listen, look at this, this is about 23,000 tons. And they were so excited because they had only two points, and they built the model, and they reconstructed that at that time, it should be about 21,000 tons. They were so excited about this <laughs> coincidence this like extra point, which actually was actual data, that they uh, insisted me to become a junior co-author in this in the paper, which being published in Polar Biology next year, reconstructing Arctic catches. So that's how I got involved. But I would like to say that uh, this 20th anniversary event could not have been held without Daniel's guiding hand. And whether scientists joined this initiative out of curiosity or sense of duty, either as part of the degree or accidentally like me. In my view, CRM is not just a project. It's an institution, and it has a legacy that hopefully will live forever, and for as long as this family continues to grow and working on it. And uh, now it's diversifying as well, which you're going to hear uh, quite a bit about that. So, from the <laughs> bottom of my heart, congratulations, Daniel, and congratulations, the whole CRM family. Therefore, I will not introduce him and sat down. I know was it. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica needs an introduction. So, um, uh, Jessica is the director of research leader of the Marine Future Lab at the University of Western Australia. She's a Canadian marine ecologist with a PhD with distinction from McGill University. That is the official part that I have to say, but the really interesting part was happening in Noumea three years ago. Three years ago. Uh, when uh, she is uh, not shy, usually, but she was shy. But she approached me very shyly and said, what do you think about, she didn't dare to say it, but how about if we, if we somehow got <laughs> to start a branch of the Zealanders in Australia? And I was enthusiastic, and uh, you were, you thought I was going to say no or something. And it was a beautiful idea. And then Jessica managed, in an, at a time when her university was uh, shedding professors like leaves in form, <laughs> uh, she was able to create a new position uh, that Dirk Zeller joined, joined then, uh, because he's a, he's a, a German who camouflaged himself as Australian. <laughs> uh, and he, he had been all, all the time with the Sealanders, and uh, he took this position because he was then back in Australia, and, uh, and uh, we had a branch. In the meantime, uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, Jessica had been able to identify philanthropists with a floor who helped us, who have helping us, and also help us with the, the sister project, the Sealanders, that is closely allied with, uh, with what we do here, um, uh, got significant funding for both uh, the sea and the, uh, the fish base, and therefore we'll meet uh, at the uh, University of Western Australia. Uh, there's lots of people who are here will meet there, and let's see what she has to say about the sea around us. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I hate microphones. Can everybody hear me at the back if I speak with my loud Aussie Canadian accent? Great. Well, we've heard some personal stories about connections to see around us, so I am going to change my entry and actually start with that. So I first met Daniel in 1999 uh, when I was sent here by Amanda Vincent to prep for the Pew Fellows uh, we were having a workshop around seaboard fisheries. So there I was sitting in the old mouthfuls, um, all by myself on a Friday night, because <laughs> I didn't know anybody. I was from Montreal. And in comes Daniel saying, 
I need help. <laughs> and it was the tables for the China paper, that influential paper that transformed our understanding that reconstructed catches matter. So my small little contribution to that was pasting a word table into Excel, <laughs> recalculating, and putting it back. <laughs> but that, that launched an amazing relationship. And even though I fled uh, to warmer climates, uh, the relationship with Daniel and now Dirk and Deng and see around us has, has just continued closely through the decades, two decades now. And certainly, Australia needs to see around us. So my job today is to, I might get a little emotional, uh, I'm going to first go through a few slides that frame for me what See Around Us has done. And it is a daunting task to put 20 years of effort into 20 minutes. Uh, and then what I want to do is give an indicator of where I think we need to go in the future. And also, because I can't get away with not showing my pretty baited video, um, there'll be a little bit about our work that we do in Western Australia. So. <coughs> This is my take on reconstructed fisheries. Uh, we basically hit peak fish in 1996, and this is underpinned by the data that Daniel and the team of 400 scientists have built through the world, through the years. And when I go to Parliament in Canberra and I say, hey, hello, we're running out of fish, this is what I use. The other major useful tool from Sea Around Us that has underpinned my efforts in Australia is to say, all right, there's nowhere left to go, right? So this is the Spanish footprint between the 1950s and the 2000s that effectively shows that we're expanding all of our fisheries. Again, this is a powerful argument, not just in Canada and the US, but in Australia, where we have our head literally in the seabed. <laughs> and then finally, I would like to acknowledge um, William Chung and Vicky Lam because uh, there's been an ongoing conversation about tropicalization of Australian fisheries and the work to show that climate change is having massive impact on our fisheries and therefore our ocean resilience has been fundamental. Now we're going to see seven slides that are really boring. <laughs> okay, so when I looked at that table of contents on the 20 years, I went, oh crap, what am I going to do with that? So I realized that what I could say is there are themes that emerge from the sea around us, right, over the 20 years. And funnily enough, if you divide, if you look at, allocate all those years to themes, you get three topics by, by theme. This is perfect, right? So I can make this really easy. So first theme was vision. And I'd like to acknowledge Pew for having the vision to support the sea around us for over a decade. That's an amazing uh, commitment from and vision from a philanthropic organization. So basically, we started off with uh, Daniel's vision, uh, the Dakar uh, events, and then the Millennium Project. And so you can see on the side, the years 1999, 2000, 2003. It's important to note that the years aren't consecutive. This has not been a linear progression. It's been pulling things together through time. So the next theme was the problem, right? So they started in the North Atlantic, which is really sensible because Canada had totally trashed the cod, right? So in cod we trust, no more. Uh, then they looked at China coastal fisheries, which of course is my small contribution way back then, and the high Arctic. So this was started early, but continues in 2011. They're still identifying locations where we need to pay more attention. Australia, please, Australia. We're screwing up and nobody's paying attention because we're the world's best managed fisheries. Not. <laughs> right. And then there were surprises along the way. Whales don't eat fish. That sounds pretty obvious, but it was being argued. Problem isn't fisheries management, it's the whales. Jellyfish, I'm wearing the earrings um, in honor of Daniel today. They're dangly and heavy, I have to say. Uh, but that transformed people's view of how things work, right? Because all of a sudden we went, crap, are we really going to be eating jellyfish? Is that what fishing down the food web means? That was transformational at the time. And then, of course, everybody loves sharks and dolphins and whales, and we needed to pay attention to forage species because they underpin the ecosystem. So those were the things that emerged, I thought, in 4, 8, and 12. And again, it's not just a little chunk of time. It's coming back all the time. Economic choices. Um, I don't see Rashid. 
uh, but uh, he quoted me beautifully, by the way, at our oceans. He talked about Australia's marine protected network as a prick condom. <laughs> and I'll forever love him for quoting me on that. Uh, but basically, you know, despite Daniel being a biologist and his team, they've always understood the importance of e economics. And so that resulted in amazing work around um, uh, the, you know, the fact that fuel is a major issue, subsidies. Also came up the issue of um, seafood awareness, and I think we're all having a little scratch our head about the Marine Stewardship Council mm -hmm. and how do we deal with that more appropriately because it ain't working. So that was five to seven. Um, it's not in here directly, but we also did some work on slavery because, of course, when you can't make a buck fishing, you abuse labor. That's how you make it profitable. And so I'm very proud of the work that we did in 2018 on that score. And then climate. Uh, can't escape climate, sadly. Uh, so that work began actually quite early in 2009. Was way ahead of when fisheries people were thinking about that. And it continues to date because guess what? We haven't solved the problem, right? So we need to think hard about uh, large marine parks and what their role is in the climate challenge, and I'll come back to that. Uh, solutions. So note. Solutions started in 2010, did more work in 14 and 15, and it was really this hard question about are RFMOs working? Short answer is no. Uh, you know, understanding seafood security. We gotta feed people, right? And it's easy for, uh, for me in Australia because people don't depend on seafood. But aquaculture is not easy, but what are the options? So understanding <coughs> that there's a difference between farming fish at the bottom of the food chain seafood versus at the top of the chain. And again, the audacious, somebody used the word earlier, the audacious idea that if we close the high seas, not only would you have more fish, you'd have greater equity and social justice. See, I'm getting goosebumps. Mm -hmm. Right, so that was the solutions. Now note, I have one less, last slide. Solutions are pretty freaking obvious. Marine parks, think about agriculture carefully. Better governance. People still weren't listening. So a lot of the work that I see coming out now is actually around what is the asset. And that was underpinned by the long project of reconstructing global fisheries, the world catch. We're now uh, the work by Rayner, which is amazing on proper effective stock assessments in data deficient areas. And then really the answer is not whether our fisheries are going up, down, sustainable, blah, blah, blah. Right? It's about how much is left. Right? So B over BMSY. So that's where we're going to now. So those are my slides without pictures because I actually didn't know what pictures to put <laughs> on these because it's so diverse. Right. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that uh, the old saw about standing on the shoulders of giants, a lot of um, what's been possible under sea around us and for the 400 partners actually builds on the back of fish base and now sea life base. We can't do the sea around us work without fish base and sea, sea life base. So hold up your hand if you've used fish base in the last month. Right. <laughs> so here's my, here's my task. Daniel cornered me into being the vice chairman of the fish base symposium. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, we need a sustainable fishing, uh, sustainable funding model for fish base, and I charge every single one of you who uses it to talk to your institutions and figure out how you can support fish base. Because without fish base, sea around us is tough. And without sea around us, we can't make change. So if every single one of us who uses fish base, who uses sea around us, has any advocacy, ever touches fish base and sea life base, right? We need to support them. And thank you to Deng for her hard work on first thing. Yeah, for making that work. Okay, so 20 years. I think the future is marine parks. Fisheries management is a failed experiment. We can't manage oceans without it. We need fisheries management, but it is not sufficient to transform our oceans. This is a map of all of the uh, existing large marine protected areas, over 100,000 square kilometers in the world. It is inadequate. Green is fully no takes. Uh, yellow is partially protected. When did your sex ed teacher tell you that worked? Just <laughs> being lighter than Rashid today, but a big condom. 
But if you look at Australia, you know, pretty much all of our, quote, ocean protection is part of protection, even though the world's leader and will meet our action targets. So this is where we need to go next, in my view. What I want to flag <laughs> is that I think the amazing relationship I have with see around us is that you, you guys use um, cache data, right? We drop cameras, as uh, Daniel referred to, and basically a, a baked camera, that's a baked bake canister. We've got two GoPros. I own more GoPros than anybody else in the Southern Hemisphere. I have 350, and they're still not sponsoring me. But the key thing is that by dropping these rigs in the water, we get a picture that we otherwise only ever had from dead fish on the back of a fishing boat. So my team in Australia, they basically identify every single animal that comes through, they count them, and they measure them because size is everything, right? So if you don't know whether your population is comprised of little immature animals or big animals. So what I want to flag is that I think there's a very powerful opportunity to twin the empirical field data, and that's why I'm so glad that UWA stole dirt from UBC. Why did you ever let him go, by the way? Um, but twinning. Uh, what we do empirically with field data, with the catch data, so that we can get a better picture of what our oceans look like and where we need to put our marine parks. Then, right. So this goes on and on and on, and we've got endless video. We've now got uh, 10,000 samples from 27 locations around the world. Many of those are the marine parks that have now been um, established, and that's in collaboration primarily with National Geographic through their pristine seas program. Uh, and it's like, no, you can go diving on a coral reef, right? People know coral reefs, but what do you do about the big blue, right? Nobody gets it, so that's what we do. Hard data and pretty pictures. Oops, no, sorry. So two things, and this is my twinning of Sea Around Us data and my baited remote underwater video systems. This is a paper from uh, Boucher et al, 2015, where we use the catch data from Sea Around Us around us to model hot spots of catch based on bathymetry and environmental <coughs> characteristics. The idea being these are the places that you should put your marine parks because they're full of fish, the few that we have left. Uh, so this was one example of how we could use the sea around us data to identify important places in the ocean. And then this one is a model based on our camera traps that shows the hot spots of sharks that are left based on what we see on our videos, model predicted as a function of bathymetry, environmental conditions, and distance to humans, right? So the reason there are no sharks are here, right? I mean, they were there. So again, this is about identifying where we can go. And the important thing I'm excited about with ongoing collaboration with Sea Around Us is how do we twin these two sets of global understandings to get better outcomes for our oceans. And just to give you a little um, teaser, so each of these circles uh, is full of video from these locations. These are the partially protected marine parks along the West Australian coast. Each place we've gone, dropped our cameras, and we can start to understand, for instance, the mean abundance of fish across these locations before parks came in. And we can then ask the question, how did how these parks perform? And the answer will be probably not very well because they're partially protected. But interestingly, Montebello, which has the highest abundance of fish, is remote and currently protected. So this starts to give us an understanding of the baseline of what our oceans look like. So we can annoy politicians and ask for better decisions. So uh, Rachel Carson's already been uh, remembered and identified as a major player. I love this quote from her that we're the problems. We emerged from the ocean and we're now the problem for our oceans. And I also want to say that uh, in this era of Me Too, I can't um, admire her enough for having such an impact, whether it was through the sea around us or um, Silent Spring on transforming how we understand um, our wee little planet. And then this one. Mm. 
So every time I show this video, there's this tooth-sucking <laughs> kind of moment. Uh, this is from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park before it was established in the 60s. I think you can tell from the really bad swimsuit. Uh, and this was this was reasonable, right? You go down the beach for a family outing, you find a uh, turtle, you lasso it, and you ride it down into the water, right? So we look at this now and we go, oh my god, what were we thinking? Wasn't that a bad idea? And we will no doubt look back five years from now, ten years from now, saying, what were we thinking? Whether it's overfishing, whether it is um, trophy fishing and recreational activities for large sharks, all this stuff, whether it's our inability to have the courage to close areas of our oceans to protection, right? So that's my call to arms. I don't, I don't want to be the chick riding the turtle, right? So uh, with that, um, I'm done and can only say, um, Daniel, thank you for the privilege of knowing you for 20 years and of watching this journey and for all the people that you've brought into my life as a result of that. Thank you. So since everybody starts with a personal story, <laughs> uh, here's mine. I think it was in 1977, now I'm giving away my age, <laughs> where I was working as a second officer uh, on, uh, on merchant ships, German ships. I have a license to steer, steer ships in all sizes and all oceans. And uh, in 77, I decided, I was working on tankers. I was kind of fed up of having the washing water from the tanks, right? You have to arrive clean tanks in Amsterdam. How do you do that? You wash the tanks while you're steaming and you pump it all overboard. I was kind of sick of tired of doing that. And also, in my many, in the many ports I've seen while, while traveling the world on big ships, I've seen all the kids. And I, and I thought, it would be so much better if we have uh, food from the sea than if we pollute it. So in 77 I gave up my good paying job, 5,000 Deutsche Marks, to zero and started studying biology. And here I am. Okay, long story short. The abstract I skip. Uh, you can read that later. But my key point here is, basically there is hope. Because in 1982, the governments of the world agreed on the law of the sea. And it is a good law. And, and this is a binding law to all signatories. And nearly all countries of the world have signed. I don't bother with one few ones that haven't. Some people know. The US is on the of course. Anyway, so they have agreed on this. And it says, basically, that you are not allowed to do more harm than is needed to get the maximum catch to the marine populations that you exploit in your territorial waters, in your exclusive economic zone. That's what it says. Now we are 30 years later, and, uh, and actually the EU, who was in favor of the law of the sea back then, took 30 years to put it into regional law. So in 2013, they managed to do that. It's in, uh, in force since 2014. And they say we will end overfishing in all of our waters in 2015. Well, they failed that one. Latest in 2020, that's next year. And I will report on that in many places next year, whether they succeed or fail. Okay, but my, my message here is really, okay, so that is a commitment, but it has to be fulfilled, and we have to uh, hold governments responsible for it. And actually, while there was no big rush now to estimate the reference points for all stocks in the world, somehow governments were not eager. So we have to take that up ourselves, and actually with the help of current computers, which are here in mind, has eight cores working in parallel, allows us to do Monte Carlo things, that is robust statistics, that allow us to combine the data that we have with powerful statistics and get reasonable estimates on the reference points that were agreed in the law of the sea. So the data that we're looking at is basically catch. We normally may have that. If we don't have that, we may know what is the length frequency. You just measure the length and count the fish, as fishery scientists have always done. And even without catch, it gives you the reference points. 
or if you have abundance estimates from standardized surveys, research surveys, or from standardizing catches on a landing site and so on. Catch per unit of effort is a, is a term for that. You can also estimate the re uh, relevant reference points. So, let me start with catch. What have we done there? It was actually John Garland, head of FAO at the time, who quipped at one of these meetings, of the many meetings, saying, all that fishery science need to know is the catch, the catch, and the catch. And in a way, <laughs> CRMs have picked up on that. We have heard it in the previous presentations, taking up this challenge to estimate catches of all countries in the world on hopefully all species. Now, interesting, Steve Mattel, I thought this presentation was in the center, so not in this house, but Steve Mattel was a scientist at the, at the fishery center, at the, and, and Daniel dragged me in one of his lectures, say, right, I have to see this. So I was sitting in the lecture on R, statistical language, and he had an example on applying a surplus production model with a little filtering of Monte Carlo. And basically, he came up with what I show here, uh, something like this. You have here the productivity of the species, and you have here the carrying capacity of the ecosystem for how many species there can be. And with a few filters, what you know is a catch time series. You know the stock didn't crash. So you filter out all combinations of productivity and carrying capacity where the stock would crash. You filter out all those that would exceed, shoot out of the window there. And with these few filters, suddenly, all the potential points in this area come down to this small thing. That was really the wow effect. And so I published it with Steve Mattel together. And what this does, as it is in our first thing, so we have R, that is the productivity, the K, that is current capacity. It estimates very well the maximum sustainable yield, which is in the law of the sea. That is the thing where it comes from. This is nice distribution, narrow, very reliable, that method does it. But it was not so good at estimating really um, biomass. The problem was where in this thing is the best value for productivity. See, it ranges from point something, zero something, to point three. And where is the current capacity the best? Where to find the best point? And, well, I'm not a genius, I'm not very brilliant, but I'm stubborn. <laughs> so it took me two years, two years, to look at all kinds of things to find where is the best pair in this club. And there was the next paper with a couple of colleagues, and if you have more than just cash data, it tells you where the best point is, and so I have to twist that method to actually here is now our estimate, not anymore in the middle, it used to be there, here near the top, which is very close to where you find it with other things. And now the method estimates very well the exploitation rate and the biomass. The red is the observed, the true thing more or less, and the blue is if you only know catch. Okay, so that we have, we call it CMSY, and it's working well. With only catch, you get reasonable estimates of stock size and exploitation. Now, why is it? okay, I have some circles here. <laughs> Second method, we call it LBB, it's the length-based Bayesian biomass model. And I put here a huge equation just to impress you and show you that all the fishery scientists can deal with big equations, not only the climate guys or the oceanographers. And the uh, point being here is that we can parameterize this equation only with length frequencies. Remember, you count the fish, you measure them, you get length frequencies. And this is basically the theory behind it. I don't bother you too long. Here's the size of the fish, maximum size, fraction of it. Here's how many uh, live you find in the water at that size. If there's no fishing, there's more or less a gradual decline. If this was age, it would be an exponential decline. But since age over length is something like this, it compensates to get more or less a straight line. If you start fishing, the line declines, then there are fewer because you increase mortality or shorten the lifetime, and therefore the number that is alive at certain length, which is a proxy for age, gets less. So that was the blue line. Then this yellow here shows you which ones are uh, vulnerable to fishing. And what you actually see in the landing site or on, on board of the fish is just this thing. So the challenge was really to estimate all of this from what we see here. And that's 
was done and it's working. You see the outcome of it, and I don't go into detail. This is the red line that I showed. You can fix it to the points, that is what we observed. And in the end, with this nice long equation and several more of it, you get here what is the law of the sea. The time series of biomass estimates relative to carrier capacity. So just out of length frequencies we can do it. It's published, it's peer reviewed there. And what we're working on right now, coming to the end, what I call AMSY, it's abundance MSY. So if you only have catch per unit of effort, only a trend of abundance, to so standardize catches, you go out every year with the same gear, you, you drag it for half an hour, you count all the fish in there, in random areas, that gives you a CPU estimate, that is basically the line that you see here, but you don't know whether this line is close to collapse, or close to unexploited, or anywhere in between. So the challenge is to put this line, this one here which you observe, in the proper framework, Again, we have similar to the CMS Y method here, productivity and K, and some Monte Carlo or magic, and in the end, you get here again, just out of CPUE, now in the MS Y framework, the relative stock size that is required to know from the law of the C. Okay, that's it. Conclusions. Politicians and managers are running out of time, basically, are running out of accuses to honor the living ocean by not doing more damage than is needed for pretty good catches. That's my final message. Thank you. <laughs>